This podcast is brought to you by The Empowerment Project. Research proves that empowerment self-defense training makes you safer, period. I want you to have a great self-defense toolkit so you can create strong boundaries, speak with confidence, and take up all the space that you deserve in the world. We'll hear stories from survivors and find out what worked for them and why. We'll interview leaders in the field and talk about tips, concepts, and really easy things that you could do to make yourself safer and interrupt the cycle of violence. I've taught self-defense classes for over 30 years, and I promise to teach you everything I know. Ultimately, I'm going to want you to get some in-person training, but a great empowerment self-defense class is more than just the physical skills. The list of things I want to teach you is endless, so let's get to it. My name is Sylvia Smart, and welcome to The Empowerment Project. Hi, listeners. When I finally heard about my guest, Jocelyn Hollander, I'd been teaching empowerment self-defense for over 30 years. Bear with me while I work my way through telling you how incredible she is and how awesome it is to know her. My experience was that people left my classes, they were on fire, they were excited, they felt empowered. It was this visceral change. And over the years, many past participants actually have gotten in touch with me to tell me stories about how what they learned in my classes kept them safe, and even how what they learned actually changed their lives. I always thought someone should study this. I always thought ESD training is misunderstood and underappreciated. Amazing things are happening. And it seems sometimes like people just don't seem to know about it. So imagine my surprise when I found Jocelyn Hollander. Here is a wonderful, smart, incredible professor who lives just a couple of hours south of me, who not only teaches empowerment self-defense, but has made teaching about empowerment self-defense and researching empowerment self-defense her life's work. Jocelyn is a sociologist at the University of Oregon, and she studies gender and interaction. Her empirical research, her academic focus is specifically on the effects of women's self-defense training for preventing violence and empowering women. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. Why didn't I know about her for so many years? Now that is a story for another day. Today, the really important thing is that she is awesome and we have her with us. Jocelyn, I am so excited to introduce you to my listeners and them to you. Welcome. Thank you, Sylvia. I'm so happy to be here with you. Listeners don't know this, but it took us some juggling to be here today. I appreciate (laughs) that you stuck with me and we are here. (laughs) Thank you for sticking with me as well. It, It was a saga. Jocelyn, I think it's cool to start with you kind of introducing yourself and telling us how'd you get to where you are today? What was your journey like? What were some key moments that impacted you along the way? And how did you get to where you are? Sure, that's a great question. Um, Well, I I have to go way back to the beginning to to answer that question. Um, And I took my first self-defense class when I was a senior in college a long time ago. And how that came about is I I was away from campus for a few terms. And when I came back, my best friend had made some new friends while I was gone who were involved with teaching a self-defense class for women on campus. Um, It was part of an experimental program that had students teaching classes for other students. Um, It was very cool. But when I came back, she said, we have to take this class. Um, It sounds amazing. These people are amazing. I want you to take it with me. And I said, "Mm, no, thanks. Not really my thing. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, we have to take this class. You have to take it with me. And I said, "Uh, no, thanks. I'm not really that interested in this. And we went back and forth like that for quite some time. Um, And and she was very insistent. And at that point in my life, I was not terribly assertive. So eventually I gave in. And I took the class with her and I ended up loving it. 
And um, after the class was over, I started teaching the class with this group of students who had been teaching the class. Uh, it was a group in the Bay Area called Women Defending Ourselves. And I, I started teaching and learned how to teach from them. And what's, what's really funny, given the way this started, is that 30 years later, here I am. I'm still teaching, still researching um, self-defense training. Thank you, friend. Yeah. <laughs> Are you still in touch with that friend? Do you sometimes I, connect? I am, I am still in touch with that friend. Um, and I see her you know, somewhat regularly. She still lives in the Bay Area. She's not involved with self-defense anymore, but I still am. You sure are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool story. Yeah. Wow. And so, then, so how did you get to the researchy part? Like what was? Yeah. What was... So, so then I went to graduate school in sociology and um, I studied gender and people's ideas about the vulnerability and violence were kind of my focus in graduate school. Um after I came to the University of Oregon, and honestly, after I got tenure and I had a little more freedom to do what I wanted to do, I started thinking about studying self-defense because um, I was looking back and realizing, you know, it had been a really transformative experience for me. It, it, it was life changing, like you described about your students. And I started to wonder, is there any research on this? And I looked into it and it turned out that there wasn't very much research. There were a few articles um, but they were s kind of far and uh, few and far between. And there wasn't any research on whether learning self-defense really affected people's risk of victimization. So I decided I would do a research project on self-defense. Um, and again, tw you know, 20 years later, I'm still doing the research. It turns out there was quite a lot to research. So that that's how this all began. That's that's cool. So it was once you had tenure and you're like, OK, <laughs> I can think outside the box now. I think that actually when I was thinking about my dissertation when I was in graduate school, I floated the idea in front of my advisors about researching self-defense. And they basically said, mm, not a good choice. You won't get a job with that. So I put that on a back burner. And once, But once I had tenure, I could do more of what I wanted to do. Um, that's how it started. Wow, that's so great. I'm really appreciative that you... You are a perseverer, <laughs> but I think I'm learning about you. <laughs> um, so, Jocelyn, before we talk about your research, let's start by addressing the curious, odd, I don't know how to describe it, uh, opposition or resistance that people have to empowerment self-defense. You and I, and just about every other empowerment self-defense instructor I've ever spoken with in my entire life experiences a level of resistance to what we do. And it boggles my mind because as teachers, we can viscerally feel and see the weight of years and spider webs of fear melting away as participants find their voices and stand in their power. And we get to watch eyes brighten, faces light up, and like postures change as students practice drills and skills that literally change their lives for the better. We hear after every single class, this was amazing. This training changed my life. So what's the deal with this resistance, both with people who are afraid to take self-defense class or don't really don't want to take self-defense class like you, right? Like, mm, not my thing. Great example. And yeah. And also like with institutions that are like, uh, no, we don't want you to teach self-defense here at our school. So mm -hmm. I'd love to look at this and with your help, begin to sort of just talk through it a little bit and see what's your experience and what do you think about this? Yes, there is definitely a lot to untangle here. And if you could see me right now, you'd see that I was just nodding and nodding all the way, all the time that you were talking, because it, that's exactly the experience. You know, we see our students um, go through this, this transformation, many of them. And I'm, I hear this from my research participants as well. They say it was life changing. It was amazing. This is wonderful. Everybody should take this class. Um, and then we also hear all this resistance from people who haven't taken an ESD class. So there, there's there's lots to untangle. And I think I think there are really multiple reasons and multiple kinds of resistance to ESD training and to any kind of self-defense training um, for that matter. And maybe maybe we should start there because I think that one of the main re reasons for resistance, not the only one, but one of the big ones is that people don't understand what ESD training is. Right. 
And, you know, maybe they've had a self-defense class before that they didn't find empowering. They found it, you know, increased their fear. Um, Or maybe they're getting their ideas about self-defense from the media. And often those ideas do not at all fit what we do in our ESD classes. So I I really think some of the resistance is based on misinformation. Um, And I can talk about a couple different kinds of that. Yeah, please. So some of the things that I hear from people who are critical and who are resisting um, are these. Uh, One is that self-defense focuses only on stranger assault. Um, And this is from people who who know that the the vast majority of assaults come from people that that you know. Um, And they critique self-defense training for only focusing on stranger danger. Well, that may be true for some self-defense classes, but any good empowerment self-defense class spends a lot of time talking about assaults from people we know And in fact, some classes spend all of their time talking about acquaintances and intimates. And I think this is one of the things that really distinguishes ESD from other kinds of self-defense training. Yeah. Um, So, you know, it's good to to know how to deal with assaults from strangers. And of course, we teach that, but that only takes us so far because we need different strategies. So I think that's that's one thing I hear a lot. Um, Another thing people often say to me is that self-defense tells women what they should and should not do or tells people what they should and should not do. So it limits our lives and controls us. And again, that might be true for some self-defense classes. And in fact, I can think back, I was wrong. My first self-defense class wasn't in college. I actually went to a a one-time class when I was a Girl Scout. Um, When I I must have been in sixth or seventh grade, and my Girl Scout troop invited a police officer to give us safety tips. Um, And that police officer told us things like, don't walk alone. Um, always have someone else with you when you're walking alone outside, especially at night. And he also said, uh, really, he said, if you're assaulted, don't resist. Right. It'll just make things worse. So complete misinformation. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I don't really remember this terribly vividly, but I can only imagine that it made all of us feel more afraid and more helpless and more vulnerable. Um, So maybe people have had classes like that, but empowerment self-defense is not like that, as you know. ESD classes don't focus on telling people what to do. And in my experience, they they really expand people's lives rather than limiting them and making them smaller. Um, and the, the, the final kind of resistance I hear all the time these days is that self-defense training puts the burden of responsibility for preventing violence on targets, not on the people who are causing the problem, on perpetrators. So people will say to me, Instead of teaching self-defense classes to women, why don't we just teach men not to rape? Um, And what they really mean is that we should really teach perpetrators not to perpetrate, right? Because, of course, most men are not perpetrators. Right. Um, And yes, that would be great if we had any idea how to do it. Um, And there's been there's been quite a bit of research looking at different interventions trying to reduce perpetration. And none of those interventions have actually been shown to be effective in reducing perpetration in the behavior. Some some seem to change attitudes, but the attitudes don't necessarily translate into change behaviors. And some of those interventions actually were ineffective and unhelpful. And they made things worse. So, um, it, you know, it'd be great to teach, to teach that, but we just don't have a clue how to do it. There's also, right now, there's a lot of interest in bystander intervention. That's kind of the hot topic in violence prevention. Um, in, let's just teach other people to intervene if they see that violence or assault is about to happen. But again, uh, we just don't have the research evidence yet to show that it actually reduces victimization or perpetration. There's some, it's, it's promising, perhaps, but it, it doesn't, we don't know that it works. Um, so in the absence of any other evidence, we have to use what we know works. And what we know right now that works is empowerment self-defense training. And we have good evidence for that. Yeah. So, okay. So the misinformation, let's see, it is one, um, they are, the self-defense classes are teaching stuff that's scary and um, stranger danger. And we know that that's like, that's one resistance. Another one, what's the second one? (laughs) <laughs> the second one is that self-defense training controls people's lives. Oh, right. Like, Do's and don'ts. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't do this. Don't wear that. Yeah. Uh, limiting versus empowering. Yeah. And then the third one is it puts it on the backs of the people who are getting assaulted. 
You know, it's it's funny, Jocelyn, I've started hearing that one too. Like that was maybe like six or seven years ago that I first mm-hmm. heard that. And it was with um, young women who were in my daughter's high school. And they were like, I'm not taking self-defense with you. Men just need to stop raping. Yes. And I was like, I know they do. <laughs> I know they do, but it's not happening. Like right. until they do, this is cool stuff. Duff, like this could actually keep you safer. Yeah. So and it has all sorts of other benefits, which we can talk about later. But even if even if it didn't keep you safer, I think it would still be worth doing yeah. because of all the other things that come along with it. Yeah. Um, but yes, I have heard that that the one about not you know teaching men not to rape from a lot of people, and it, it it's become kind of a common line, especially from women and especially from feminists. Um, and I, I kind of understand why, because for so long, all the focus of um, what, what was called prevention was has been on on women, um, and really it wasn't on prevention; it was on helping survivors after the fact, which is also important. But it's, it doesn't actually prevent assault, um, and we put so much attention on to women and not so much on to perpetrators. Um, so I really appreciate that this instinct to to start putting more focus on perpetrators, but we just don't have the, we, we just don't know what to, how to do it. We don't know how to fix this from that end yet. Right. Someday we might, but not yet. And yeah, and that I, I also, yeah. Okay. So I have a lot of feelings about that, but mm-hmm. we can maybe say that for another conversation. <laughs> but I think, you know, like based on that misinformation, those three, those are three great topics. I also, I mean, I think based on that, things that I've heard are um, participants, because I, I ask, like, what, you know, what kept you from coming years ago? Like, what were some obstacles that you had to overcome to sign yeah. up for my class? And um, so I've been doing, like, my own little market research just to find out. And things yeah. I hear are, um, I'm not good enough. Like, I don't know how to fight. And I'm too heavy or I'm too old or I'm too out of shape or I just can't do it or I don't want to fight. I'm, I believe in peace and I am afraid I'm going to get hurt or it's not worth it. I can't afford it. I don't have the time or I don't need it or I'm just afraid. I had one woman before she signed up for my class. She said, are you going to fight me? Oh, I know. And I was like, no, you're going to hit me. (laughs) And I'll be holding a pad. I'll be fine. But no, (laughs) you know, so there's a lot of also misinformation. Like you don't like it. This is where you learn how to do stuff (laughs) like you don't. And we as good empowerment, self-defense instructors, we also modify anything so that anyone can do it, no matter your size, age, weight, joints, back, you know, like whether you you have some concerns, some physical concerns or challenges, like we are good at modifying what we do so that everybody can get something out of class. Yeah. And I think, I think like that some of that comes from people's misconceptions about what self-defense is. And I think a lot of their ideas about self-defense come from the media. Yeah. And what I see, you know, if I look at the media, I see a couple different images about self-defense. One is people using sort of superhuman powers, you know, actually, I mean, literally superhuman in, in movies and so on, or people using really impressive moves from martial arts, flying kicks and things like that, yeah. that of course most of us can't do. Um, and th- if that's your idea of what self-defense is going to look like, of course, you're going to be scared that you can't do it, that you're not fit enough or you're too old or out of shape or whatever. Um, but as you say, we meet people where they're at. Um, and one more thing that I think you didn't mention is that the people are afraid they're going to have to talk about scary things in a self-defense. Yes, emotionally. They have to disclose yeah. their own history. They're going to have to talk about violence. It's, it's not you know fun to contemplate talking about sexual violence, other kinds of violence. And so that can be really scary. Um, but once people get into a good ESD class, I think we really have to distinguish between a good class and a not so good class. Um, they discover that it's, it's actually fun. It's fun to learn how to use your body to do things in the world. 
Uh, and there's a wonderful community of students that you get to meet and get to know and develop bonds with. And you're not too old. You're not too out of shape. And in fact, anyone can do it. And it's not actually that scary. And of course, we don't make people disclose their own their own personal histories. Um, and that once you, you know, talking about violence can be stressful, but learning how to defend yourself helps you cope with that stress. And in the end, you end up being less afraid. Yeah. And then the, just the act of being in a group of people who are focused on this thing together who have a very common experience can make us feel like we're not alone, which is oh, such a relief for so many people. Like that's when I feel like I see the weight lifting, like, oh my gosh, you too? Yeah. It's not just me. Yeah. 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 And that there are other people who can share that with you and you can, you can talk about it and you can laugh about it and it can become a source of links and bonding to other people not just something that makes you isolated and afraid. Um, I, my, my research participants talk about that a lot, about the being in a room with other people who have the same concerns and especially um, people who aren't necessarily like them. And they talk about becoming friends with people that they would never have become friends with um, in you know, the outside, in the regular everyday world, um, which I think is a really interesting facet of this. It creates bonds between people and creates community. It does. It really does. And it's... Yeah. It's, it's pretty awesome to watch and be part of. You yeah. know, the other thing I've, I, I've been kind of like toying with this, con- this continuum, kind of geeking out on this, this thing that I'm labeling the denial awareness continuum. Mm-hmm. And Tell me about that. yeah, so, so it's, kind of connected to the fear empowerment continuum Uh (laughs) Um, if you're thinking like I am in continuums and it could end up being uh, like more of a cyclical or some I'm not sure but anyway (laughs) that so many of us walk through the world having experienced challenging things and trauma and um, hard times and and it's sometimes easier to push things down and set them to the side and pretend they're not there and go into the space of denial. Mm-hmm. And I think that a piece of this resistance to self-defense, I think it could be that if I, ad- if I admit that I want to take this class or if I reach out and find out more about this class, then I'm admitting that that there might be some reason for me to take this class. Like maybe our society isn't as safe as I want to feel like it is, or maybe I don't feel as empowered as I want to believe that I am, or maybe I am not as aware of all of the things that I think that I am. I'm not sure. I'm I'm still toying with it. Fear does things to us and on that continuum, when I look at my fear, when I walk through my fear, there is empowerment. And that is a really great way to live. And we can get there in lots of different ways. Therapy, group support, talking with friends, exercising, feeling strong in our bodies, training martial arts, like running. There are a lot of different ways, but an empowerment self-defense class, to me, it takes us from this sort of denial fear and catapults us to this awareness and empowerment in this very brief space and time. And it's just so cool. But anyway, that's my, me kind of geeking out on this. (laughs) I think, I think you're right though. I think that a lot of this, uh, this sort of personal resistance is really self-protective. And it is the sense that if I, if I open this up, if I start to explore this, it's going to open up a big, you know, can of worms (laughs) and all, all this stuff is going to come out. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to address it and deal with it. And that might make me have to change, change different parts of my life. Um, and that, that's a really scary thing to, to contemplate, especially if you, if you don't know what the benefits are going to be. Um, I mean, you and I, as teachers, we have seen this happen many, many times. We know what the benefits are likely to be for any individual, but as you're approaching that, you, you don't know about the benefits. You just know about the dangers. Right. Um, and one of the things I, that one of the images I keep, I keep thinking about as you're speaking 
is sometimes we here at the University of Oregon will we'll do um, open workshops for people. And, you know, they come, come and learn self-defense for a couple of hours. And we'll be sitting there in the classroom before it's supposed to start. And I see people walk past the door and they look inside mm. and then they keep walking. And then I'll see them come back and walk the other way and look inside and keep walking. And I, I, I just have this sense that they are, they're experiencing so much trepidation about what might happen inside the room. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a big unknown. I think that's part of why our best marketing for our classes is word of mouth. Right. When I hear, I ask my students all the time, you know, how did you come to take this class? And they, they tell me, you know, my, my best friend took it. My roommate took it. Somebody I know told me how great it was. And that's enough to help them get over that, those fears. Um, and those that, but I do think it is self-protective. People are taking care of themselves, which of course is good self-defense. Um, they're trying to keep themselves from having to experience what seems like it might be, might be difficult. But right. once we can get them into that room, that really helps reduce, I think, people's fears. It's very courageous to step into a self-defense it class. Is, yeah. I always say that because you don't know. Yeah. And yeah, you're, you, you are risking exposure or facing your fears. I mean, it, it is courageous to yeah. sign up and take a class. Absolutely. It's a, it's, it's such, it's such a brave thing to do. Yeah. What about the resistance that we get? Like, okay, Jocelyn, why is self-defense not taught in every elementary school across the country oh once goodness. a year or one week out of every school year from the time you're in kindergarten all the way through high school? Why? What's that yes. about? <laughs> Oh my goodness. And you know, that's one thing that my, my students and my research participants often say is like, why didn't anyone teach me this information earlier? And this should be required in every school and every university. So yeah, why, it, why isn't it? Um, I mean, I think, I think there are lots of reasons. Um, schools can be worried about liability yeah. if they're teaching students strategies that could hurt somebody else. Um, or they can feel squeamish about teaching anything that might seem like it might be related to sex or sexual assault. And of course, self-defense doesn't have to be framed that way, but it often does get framed that way. Um, you know, people say they have a, the curriculum's full, but I think a, a lot of it is, goes back to those myths and stere stereotypes about, about what self-defense is. Good point. Yeah. But, you know, what I think is, I keep thinking, what if this material was taught in schools? How might it change kids experiences and interactions, both as kids and, and as adults, um, and how much suffering might it, it prevent? Um, we, know, we know that girls and young women have, are at the highest risk for sexual assault. Um, I think the current statistics, as best we know, are that for women who have experienced a rape or an attempted rape, something like 80% happen before age 25 and about right. more than half before age 18. Um, and we also know that people who are assaulted once are at higher risk of being assaulted multiple times. So if, if we could help prevent that first assault, we could actually be pre preventing all the later assaults at the same time. So we really need to get this information to people as early as possible. And of course, I also think about the other possibilities, um, the other possible effects of teaching this material earlier, like kids who feel empowered in their everyday lives um, to have healthier relationships and what the consequences of those might be for, for their lives. So I really think this is where the action is, is figuring out how to teach this material earlier. Oh, I so agree. My story as a mom yeah. is that my, um, my daughter was in uh, kind of a middle school, high school. So she was there for seven years in that one school. From the beginning, that first year, I approached the principal several times a year and just said, Hey, this is what I do. I'm happy to come in yeah. teach for free at a time that works for you after school, during school, during lunchtime, in the morning, um, on the weekend, like have your people come yeah. to my school. I can do it out in the courtyard, like for free, for free, <laughs> for free, like, you know, like whatever works for you. Every year for seven years. Wow. And they never, never took me up on that offer. That's and remarkable. It was just so frustrating. Yeah. yeah. What do you think it was about? What do you think was going on there? 
Well, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and I guess, I guess what it's a different principle now, but I think now looking back on that time, I think it probably would have been really awesome for me to make an appointment and just sit down and say, Hey, what are the, what are the things that are getting in your way? Yeah. You know, to find out. But I think, I think maybe part of what we need to do is to figure out how to have self-defense classes solve problems that principals have already. Um, Mm. And maybe, you know, if they're worried about things like bullying or about kids, um, you know, not feeling safe, um, tying what we do to those problems that they are already experiencing, maybe that's a way of helping us get the material in the door so that they can see the positive effects. Because I think, you know, they have the same fears as everybody else does about about self-defense classes. But once they start to find out what it is that actually happens in them, um, I imagine that it will become much less, much less scary to them as well. Right. I'm feeling a research project coming on. So um, <laughs> Jocelyn, I know you're busy, but any <laughs> listener who uh, is who is interested and who wants to do some yeah. research, or maybe there's somebody out there who already is and knows and has had these conversations, let us know. Like, let, let's all work on this because yes. this is... Absolutely. A life skill. It's like swim lessons, CPR training, fire drills. Like it's all the same. It's exactly like that. Yeah. It's exactly like the, those things. Yes. So what, before we head on, Jocelyn, are there any other like last minute thoughts or not last minute, but other <laughs> things that we haven't talked about yet that are under this sort of umbrella of resistance? Uh, yeah, I think there's actually one more category of resistance that I'd like to to think through with you, um, and it, it's it's kind of a deeper one, um, and that's the way that empowerment self defense training really challenges the status quo mm. um, and challenges our ideas about gender and challenges our current systems of gender inequality that exists in our world, and this is something that people generally don't say. Um, you know, when you ask them why they, they don't want to take a self-defense class or they don't support it. But I, I, I keep thinking about the way that self-defense training really challenges um, these, these deep underlying ideas. So ideas about women as being weak and vulnerable and not capable of taking care of themselves. And the belief, the sort of cultural belief that women should be selfless and take care of other people before they take care of themselves um, and of course, most of us don't explicitly think, you know, men are better, better than and more important than women. But that's kind of how our world is structured um, with men at the center. And ESD really challenges that. And it says basically that women and everybody really has an equal right to exist in this world and to be respected. And we have the ability and the right to defend ourselves from violence and abuse. And this this is a really big challenge to our common ways of thinking about gender in the world. And as it can be... As a result, it can be really challenging and threatening to people. Like it, it can rock the boat um, and threaten the balance of power, either like in an individual relationship um, and more broadly in society. And so, it, it's not something that it, it's it's hard to you know point to it and say that this is the reason. But I had the sense that the that feeling of threat is really what underlies some of the resistance to ESD training. Oh my gosh! You know that, Sylvia. Yes, I am so glad you brought this up. <laughs> Challenge to the balance of power in relationships. Yeah. 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 And culturally, politically, yeah. as people, women, um, you know, LGBTQ, people who are in marginalized communities find their voices, yep. setting new boundaries, saying, I don't like that. Yep. I want it different. This doesn't work for me. I, you know... Yes, finding our power can be hugely challenging for other people who have commonly, historically held that position of power. Exactly. Yep. It's it's threatening. It's really threatening. And I see that in, like with minimizing what it is that we do or patronizing, like, you know, patting me on the shoulder and saying, ooh, you're pretty strong for a woman oh, yes. Yes. or judging 
or mm-hmm. scoffing or making a joke or making light of it. Like, Ooh, better watch out for you. you know, <laughs> like All of those things. Yes. Yes. All of those jokes. I think when I first started doing self-defense many years ago, that was the number one thing that people would say like, Ooh, you're going to hit me now. You're going to beat me up. Um, all those sort of really judgmental, really, um, uh, patronizing jokes. Wow. So how are we going to change this? <laughs> all this well, resistance, know, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> you know, I, I ask my research participants, the ones who are taking classes now, what kind of reactions they get from their partners or their friends or their parents. And they are actually telling me that things have changed, that there isn't as much of the joking and minimizing um, that I used to see from mm-hmm. pretty much all the guys I knew. Mm-hmm. And they, they don't report that, which I think is really interesting. And it suggests to me that, that actually there is a shift happening in the world and people are not seeing it as threatening. And that's individuals, though. I mean, the culture as a whole is still threatened. Sure. Um, but there, there, something's changing uh, out there in the world. But, you know, the, the real thing we have to do is just change, change society and change inequalities. Um, I don't know how to do that. Well, I <laughs> thought you would have do. a little magic wand that you could just like yeah. wave around. That would be great. Let's do that. Okay. Ready? Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That's awesome. Like to, to talk with you about this, have some real time to kind of think through all the different pieces of it, to really put it out there and hope that, um, that there are people out there work. There are lots of empowerment, self-defense teachers and people doing this work. And, you know, the more that we work together and kind of figure things out together, the, the, the more we empower one another, the more things are going to change and all this resistance and yes, the more we can work through it. Yes. And I do see it changing and there's, you know, the, the, the EST community is really growing. Yeah. And I think I, it feels to me like there's, there's change happening. Oh, Jocelyn, it's really great to talk with you about this. I so appreciate your, oh, your thinking, your research, your thought process about this component, this resistance, which we've talked a little bit about, but now we got to really talk about it. So thanks for sharing. Thank you, Sylvia. It's been great to sort of think through these things with you and bounce ideas off each other. It's been very fun. It's affirmation time. This is how I end every self-defense class. It's kind of cheesy, but it's very cool, and this is how it works. We're going to do like a little call and response. If you can say this out loud, if you can repeat after me, do it, because it's important, I think, for you to hear your own voice. But if you can't, like if you're on a crowded subway or someplace where it's embarrassing, don't worry. You can also just say it inside your head. Okay, so I'm going to say something and you're going to repeat it after me. I'm going to give you space to do that. And at the end, we're going to say yes. Here we go. Repeat after me. I am worth protecting. I love myself. I belong. I deserve to take up space on planet Earth. I am a strong and powerful person. Yes! Woohoo! And hey, as a wrap up, will you do me a favor? Will you do all the things that you do when there's a podcast? Like, will you tell your friends? Will you subscribe? Will you come back each week? Communicate with me? Review this podcast? Like, all those things to help get more bandwidth, help more people find out about it. That would be super awesome. Take a deep breath. You are amazing. Thank you for being with me. See you next time.